Hello everyone and welcome to lecture seven of distributed systems. Today we will be talking about consistency of replicas. Now consistency is a bit of a terrible word unfortunately because it means so many different things depending on who you're asking and which context you're talking about. So just some of the things where some of the contexts where you might have seen consistency is in the context of transactions. So an ACID transaction, the C stands for consistency. And in this context, the, con the meaning of consistency is a property of a database state. So we're saying that the database is in a consistent state. And if you apply a good transaction to it, then it moves the database from one consistent state into another. So here, consistent really means that the state of the database satisfies certain invariants or certain constraints that the application has set. As one example, if you have a, a university database, you might have a consistency requirement that whenever a course has at least one student enrolled in it, then it must also have a lecturer. So it must not be without lecturer. For example, you could have those kinds of consistency properties. But this ACID consistency is not actually what we're usually talking about in distributed systems. We saw a different model of consistency a few lectures ago, read after write consistency, which was that if a client makes a write and then reads back what it has just written, it should be able to see what it has just written. That has got nothing to do with the consistency in the sense of acid. It's a very different meaning of the word. So in the context of replication, uh, what we often say is we want one replica to be consistent with another replica, uh, which again raises the question of what exactly we mean. Uh, so does that mean the replicas are in the state, in the same state? But when exactly do they have to be in the same state? They could be in the same state at different points in time, for example, or in different states at the same time. Um, we could express consistency in terms of what the results of read operations uh, should be, what we expect. So I'm just say saying here, there are lots of different forms of consistency and no one true definition of consistency. There are in fact a whole bunch of different consistency models. And in this lecture, we're going to look at some of those consistency models and see the context in which they are useful and how they are defined. So what I want to start with is distributed transactions. So you've covered transactions in the first half of this course on concurrent systems. And if you recall the ACID properties, the A stands for atomicity, which means that if a transaction makes a bunch of updates to the database, then even if the database crashes or something goes wrong, either all of those updates are applied to the database and they are made durable, uh, in which case the transaction is set to commit, or all of the updates, none of the updates take effect, in which case the transaction is said to be aborted. So we have this kind of binary choice of a transaction, either it commits uh, or it aborts, but we don't end up with this kind of half state where some of the um, transactions updates have happened and others have not have happened. And this is very important because if you want to ensure something like consistency in the sense of acid, you do have to have atomicity as the foundation of that um, because otherwise you could end up with um, two changes that need to be coordinated in some way. Uh, and if only one of the two happens, then you end up in an inconsistent state. So that's why we need atomicity. Now in a distributed system, we might have a transaction that involves more than one node in a distributed database, for example. And in this type of system, uh, we have to ensure atomicity across all of the nodes that are participating in the transaction. So all of the nodes on which data is being read or written in the course of a transaction. And so we must ensure that the transaction either commits on all of the nodes or it aborts on all of the nodes. Um, so that would then give us atomicity for the transaction as a whole across all of the nodes. Moreover, if one of the nodes involved in the transaction crashes, then we also have to make sure that we abort the transaction on all other nodes because the crash node cannot complete the transaction. It cannot commit the transaction. And this is known as the atomic commitment problem in distributed systems. So you might think, hmm, this looks kind of a bit similar to consensus because what we want here is all of the nodes to agree on whether to commit or abort the transaction, which kind of smells like consensus. Now, yes, superficially, um, but if we look at it in more detail, actually atomic commitment is quite different from consensus. And so let me just explain why. Uh, with consensus, uh, the way I explained it previously was that you have multiple nodes 
uh, or one or one, one or more node may propose some value, um, and one of those values gets decided by the consensus algorithm. Whereas in atomic commit, we're a bit more constrained. We have to have all of the nodes voting on whether they are able to commit or a uh, transaction or not. And we have to take all of those votes into account. So while in consensus, it's okay to simply pick any one of the values that has been proposed, in atomic commit, it's very clearly defined what must happen. If all of the vote, if all of the nodes vote to commit, then the transaction must commit. If any one of the nodes votes to abort, then all of them must abort. So atomic commit is much more constrained in the decision that the algorithm has to make. Uh, and finally, with consensus, we've seen that we can have algorithms like raft, which can continue working as long as a quorum of nodes is reachable and responding to requests. Whereas with atomic commit, because we have this requirement that all of the nodes must, uh, must vote and we must get um, consensus across all of them, this means now that uh, even just one single node crash will cause the entire uh, transaction to abort. So uh, atomic commit is not able to tolerate any faulty nodes whereas a consensus algorithm, a fault tolerant consensus algorithm like Raft is able to tolerate a minority of faulty nodes in the system. So this is atomic commitment. And the way we typically implement atomic commit is using an algorithm called two-phase commit. Now, two-phase commit sounds a bit like two-phase locking, which you've seen previously. Don't confuse the two. They sound very similar, but they're very different things. So two-phase locking is around serializable isolation whereas two-phase commit is around getting atomicity, a very different area. So the way we start two-phase commit is that the client wants to uh, open a transaction, begin a transaction on multiple database nodes, and it just starts a transaction as usual, sends some transaction identifier T1 to those nodes, and then does its usual thing. So uh, the transaction may read and write arbitrary objects in the database, uh, and do whatever it needs to do, any, any kind of logic. Two-phase commit only starts when we're ready to commit the transaction. So rather than the usual form of transaction commit where the client just sends directly to the database, hey, commit now, please. With two-phase commit, instead, the request to commit goes to a new node in the system called the transaction coordinator. So this commit request goes to the coordinator and the coordinator then sends a prepare message to all of the uh, database nodes that are participating in the transaction. And the purpose of the prepare message is it's kind of like commit, except it doesn't actually finish the transaction yet. So what prepare does is when, when a database node receives the prepare message, the database node has to write all of the changes, all of the updates from that transaction to disk. And it has to check any constraints um, to make sure that we have consistency of the database. Because in response to that prepare message, the database node now has to reply with either yes or no, whether it's willing to commit that transaction or not. And so as we said, any one node response to this will cause the transaction to abort. But if all of them vote yes, then the transaction will commit. So this means that once the database node uh, replies saying, OK, I'm happy to commit this transaction, it is promising that it will definitely be able to commit that transaction in the future. Because there's at this point, the, um, the database node has abdicated its, its responsibility. Now it's up to the transaction coordinator to make the decision whether or not to commit the transaction. So the database node just has to promise that if it is asked later by the coordinator to commit the transaction, it will definitely be able to commit it. So it's not allowed to back out and flake out afterwards and say, oh, sorry, I don't want to commit this after all, um, because by that point, it's too late. So by the time that the prepare message is telling the uh, database nodes that it must get everything ready to be able to commit, but without actually ending the transaction yet. And then if the coordinator says in phase two of two phase commit, if the coordinator says, okay, now we're going to commit, then the individual database nodes go, they do the actual commit, they end the transaction, they release all of the locks and everything is done. So this is the uh, model of two-phase commit. And the key moment in this protocol is here. So after the, um, the database nodes, the participating nodes have replied, uh, 
to the coordinator saying whether or not they're willing to commit this transaction. At this point, the coordinator makes the decision whether to commit or abort. And this is really a key moment in the protocol. Now, we can think about what happens if some of these nodes crash. So if the database node crashes, then we've discussed that. That means the transaction coordinator will time out and it will say, okay, we're going to abort the transaction for everyone. So that's fine. The question is what happens if the coordinator crashes? So if the coordinator crashes, well, first of all, it has to make this decision on whether to abort or commit the transaction. So it can write that decision to disk. And so then when the coordinator recovers from its crash and starts back up again, it can read it, this decision from disk and uh, send the decision that it made to, to the replicas that were participating in the transaction. Um, or if there was no decision record on disk, then the coordinator can just abort. But it has to be, even if the coordinator crashes, if it made the decision before the crash to commit, then it must honor that decision after it restarts because it might have already sent the commit message to some of the nodes, but not all of them. Um, and so some of the nodes may have already committed and released all of their locks. So now everybody, we have to ensure that everybody else commits as well. And likewise, if one aborts, then all of the others have to abort as well. But this leaves us in a problem because the coordinator is now this linchpin in, in this protocol um, because if the coordinator crashes just at the moment after the prepare requests have been sent out, but before the coordinator has sent out its decision on whether to commit or abort the transaction, then all of the other nodes don't know what the coordinator has decided. It, they are simply stuck. They cannot end their transaction yet. They can't abort their transaction because, as I said earlier, they have promised that they will be able to commit it. So if they abort it, then they wouldn't be able to commit it anymore. So they can't commit or abort their transaction. They're all stuck in this uh, state of being uncertain of what the state uh, of the transaction is. Um, and so the individual nodes can't just decide for themselves to abort or commit because that would risk violating atomicity. So the entire algorithm is blocked until the coordinator restarts and recovers its state from disk. So this is not great because if a coordinator crashes, it may, might take a while to come back up again. Um, if the machine where the coordinator was running on experienced a hardware failure, it's even worse because you know somebody has to go and take the hard disk out of that machine and put it into a new machine and so on. So the whole system could be down and locked up for quite a significant amount of time. Fortunately, there is a way around this. And there is an algorithm, uh, a variant of two-phase commit that is fault tolerant, and it relies on what we talked about in the last lecture on total order broadcast, i.e. a consensus algorithm. And it works like this. This algorithm is just two slides long. Um, and the idea here is that we use a total order broadcast algorithm to disseminate each node's, dis each node's vote on whether to abort or to commit. And so for each node, we're going to have some state here. So for each transaction, we're going to have a set containing uh, a set here containing the replica IDs that have voted in favor of committing a certain transaction. We have the set of all of the replicas that are participating in a certain transaction. And for each transaction, we have a flag telling us whether we have decided yet or not. And so uh, now when we want to commit a transaction, we do the same as we do usually the, the coordinator, what the coordinator would usually do which is it just sends a prepare message to all of the nodes participating in the transaction. Okay, that's just a regular prepare message as before. When a node or a replica receives this prepare message, it's now, okay, it knows, it now knows the set of replicas that are participating in this transaction called R. So it, it remembers that this is the set of replicas participating in transaction T. And now as before, the replica needs to check whether it is able to commit the transaction and it will reply to the prepare request saying either yes or no. And if it says it, yes, it promises that it will definitely be able to commit this transaction in the future. So this okay will simply be a Boolean here saying true or false, whether it is able to commit the transaction or not. And now rather than sending this vote back to the coordinator, we use total order broadcast to send this vote to all of the replicas that are participating in this transaction. So now, all of the replicas find out about each other of who is able to commit what. Uh, and this gets us most of the way there 
The question is just what if one of these replicas has crashed? And so if that replica has crashed, then it is not able to broadcast its vote. So all of the others would be stuck waiting forever until this vote never turns up. So what we have in addition is a failure detector. And this failure detector, this, this can be running on any node, for example, on some of the other database replicas or even on the client. Uh, and it just checks whether it suspects any of the replicas to have failed. So if it has sent the prepare request to some replica and the replica has not broadcast its vote yet after some amount of time, some time out, then this other node is just going to broadcast a vote on behalf of the replica that it has suspected to have failed and it just votes false. So it votes to abort on behalf of this replica. Now what could happen, as you can see here, is that actually it could be that the replica uh, here that is suspected to have crashed hasn't actually crashed. It might be fine. It might just be a bit slow. And so it could be that just around about the same time, we get two conflicting votes for the same replica. That is one genuine vote from the replica uh, that the replica itself is sending and one vote or maybe even several votes from other replicas who think this particular node has failed. And so now we are relying on the property of total order broadcast, which is all of the uh, participants, all of the nodes in the system will deliver the same messages in the same order. And because of that, this race between the different votes for the same replica is no longer a problem because we can ensure that uh, the first vote that we see from a given replica will be the same for all of the nodes. And so this means here, whenever we deliver one of these votes here by total order broadcast, we can just consider the first vote from any given replica and ignore any future votes. And this will ensure that all of the nodes then come to the same decision as to whether to abort or commit the transaction. So first of all here, if this replica that is voting is not already one of the uh, votes that has committed, and if the replica is one of the replicas in the transaction T, and we have not already made a decision for transaction T, then, well, okay, it depends whether we voted in favor or not. So if we voted true, which means vote in favor of committing, then we add the replica ID to the set of replicas that have voted in favor of committing this particular transaction. And if this set of replicas that have voted in favor equals the set of all replicas participating in the transaction. That means now we have the unanimity that we require. We can decide to commit the transaction and do the actual commit at this node. On the other hand, if the uh, vote was false, it was in against uh, committing. That means we can immediately abort because one single vote against is already enough to scupper the whole transaction we can set our flag to be decided to be true, and then we're going to abort the transaction at this node. And if you think about this, the logic uh, that we have here ensures that we only count the first vote from any given replica. And because all of the nodes will agree when they're delivering these votes, they will agree on which the first vote was from a given replica, this will ensure that all of the participants see the same and come to the same decision as to whether to commit or abort this transaction. Isn't that nice? We have this total order broadcast algorithm and we can use it to solve this quite different problem in a reasonably simple way.